This evening, we have the opportunity to hear Shirley discuss her debut novel with journalist and author Sarah Ayub. Sarah is a freelance journalist and best-selling author based in Sydney, Australia. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, The Australian, The Sydney Morning Herald, Marie Claire, Ali, SBS, Sydney Review of Books and more. And she is a regular speaker at writers' festivals, schools and conferences around Australia, where she passionately advocates for diversity in literature and for empowering young people to see the value in their own personal stories. Shirley Lee, as well as being the author of Funny Ethnics, is a member of the Sweatshop, sorry, is a member of Sweatshop, a Western Sydney literacy movement and she received the inaugural Sweatshop Mentorship with publisher Firm Press in 2018. Her book, Funny Ethnics, was shortlisted for the Age Book of the Year and longlisted for the Reading's New Australian Fiction Prize. Her short stories and essays have been published in SBS Voices, Overland, The Guardian, Mianjin, and Another Australia. Please welcome Sarah and Shirley. Hi everyone, it is my Hi. absolute pleasure to be in conversation with one of my favourite writers, Shirley Lee. Welcome Shirley. Thank you so much Sarah, I have so much respect for you, I've always looked up to you and your work, um, so this is an absolute honour. I am Zooming from Daru country, what about you Shirley? Um, I'm speaking from the lands of the Burramadigal people of the Darug clan. Awesome. So I am so excited to be in conversation about Funny Ethnics, which was one of my favourite reads last year. And I'd like to kick off by asking you about um, the descriptions of Western Sydney and the fact that you describe Western Sydney and its people in such an amazing way. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up what people perceived your area to be like and how you address those perceptions in the book. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, the book is told from the perspective of Sylvia Nguyen, a second generation Vietnamese Australian girl who grows up in Yaguna. Like Sylvia, I also grew up in Yaguna. And Yaguna is a suburb where many culturally and linguistically diverse communities live and um, it's very much a working class suburb. So it's um, right next to Bankstown, if anyone in the audience is more familiar with Bankstown than um, Yaguna. So the only time I really ever saw Yaguna on the news was when there was like a crime in the area. So um, for example, there was a stabbing at a brothel on the highway just about 10 minutes from my parents' house and that was on the news. Um, but also uh, the only times that I saw Vietnamese Australians on the news um, in back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was also for criminal activities that um, people in my community committed. So um, there was the first ever and only political assassination um, in Australia committed by Phuong Ngo um, from Cabramatta and Cabramatta, which is quite also down the highway, maybe 15, 20 minutes from Yaguna, was on the news a lot as um, some sort of like coke capital of Australia. So growing up with those um, mainstream media perceptions of my community, that in turn shaped my own understanding of my place in Australia. And it always felt like, as a Vietnamese Australian, I had something to make up for the fact that I was Vietnamese Australian. So in order to compensate for the fact that I came from a community that was spoken about in the news as, you know, drug dealers, criminals, um, violent kind of political assassinators, it was more that there was something I always had to compensate for. And I think um, Sylvia feels that too in the book. And so she grows up with a lot of expectations projected onto her, not only by um, her parents, but also by wider Australian um, society because 
wider the wider Australian society appears to already have preconceptions of who she is. Um, and of course, I, I can't forget Pauline Hanson during that time. Uh, she was so formative to those years for not only Vietnamese Australians but Asian Australians as well. So um, she made she uh, delivered her maiden speech um, in, I think it was 1995 or 1996, and I can just remember the tension in not only my family but also um, the Vietnamese-Australian community in Western Sydney at the time. Um, a lot of our community are refugees who arrived to Australia by boat, including my parents, and so um, having... Uh, such opinions broadcast on national television saying that, oh, you know, Australia is being swamped by Asians. Um, there was a fear in the community uh, and a lot of us were wondering. I remember hearing the adults really wondering, is this going to affect government policy? Do they have a right to send us back? Because this woman is um, she's in parliament. She obviously represents... Um, a group of people and it seems to be a growing number of people at the time um, and so that's how I grew up that's the context in which I grew up um, and, uh, and yeah sorry yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I did have a question about um, you know Pauline Hanson's maiden parliamentary speech what's really interesting about that speech is the language that is used she didn't just say you know Australia you know, might be swamped by Asians or could be swamped by Asians, but the language that she used is in danger of being swamped by Asians. And in journalism classes, I talk about that language that is weaponized to make people feel that their next door neighbors are a perceived threat. And early on in the novel, a neighbor hurls a book through the window of Sylvia's family home and wrapped around that brick is a newspaper article containing Pauline Hanson's speech. And yeah. when you were answering that question, you actually gave me goosebumps. I've got, like, I've got goosebumps <laughs> because your experience mirrors my own. Even though we come from two different cultural groups, I could relate to so much of what you were saying. And Amani Haida in her memoir, The Mother Wound, talks about children of migrants, especially daughters, as having to reach through like reach back through time and space to make their parents yeah. sacrifice or their parents' decision to migrate right. to this country worth it. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in, you know, what you were talking about, how you yeah. had to those things that were projected on you. Yeah. Um, so what role did events like that, like the brick hurled through, you know, Sylvia's mm -hmm. window, or for you, like hearing Pauline Hanson's speech or being aware of that, what role did those events play in your own life growing up and how did you integrate them into like a, a fairly funny story? <laughs> um, I think it's already awkward growing up, but when you grow up with so much kind of anxiety and imminent kind of danger in your life um I really wanted to question what that does to a character and for Sylvia those anxieties kind of manifest in her awkwardness and she's always kind of on the sideline observing people and um in a lot of the book she's almost scared to take action um until she finally does and uh you know things just get funnier from there but I never really intended for the book to be like super funny or anything like that I think there there's a, a broad spe spectrum of humor from you know something that you're genuinely having a full-bellied laugh at to um, an awkward laugh or a forced laugh because you don't know how else to process what's going on. And if you actually do process what's going on, it seems to be uh, more traumatic in a way. And so humour is kind of like this salve and this barrier that Sylvia builds 
act up to protect herself and to protect herself from really feeling all the feelings at times. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the role that humour kind of plays. I actually have one of your um, books right here, Sarah, and I picked up um, the voice of, you know, how the main character in this book speaks and there's humour in that too. So I think there's definitely a connection between our writing styles. And so what does that mean for you? Like how does humour come into play in your work? I think exactly like what you said about like about it being a balm or a salve, like something that we use to protect ourselves. Um, like you, I grew up at a very tough time to be Lebanese. Um, I, although I didn't have the language for it, I knew that I was a racialized subject from my teen years. And when I go out and speak at high schools, I talk to teenagers about how you know, adolescence is hard enough as it is, you know, your body is changing, you're figuring out your sexuality, people are asking you about your future, you're fumbling through your first relationships. So then he, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, or the New South Wales Premier on the evening news, on the six o'clock news, talking about how they're going to stamp out Lebanese crime, and somehow feeling responsible or being made to feel responsible for what is going on in your community, that's a very unique trauma. And I still go to events and feel like I have to justify myself in this country or that I feel like an awkward girl next to, you know, even if I'm very accomplished, I would still feel lesser than, let's say, a, a white woman because that's just how I, like, I was just put in a box for so long. And I think when you've been through so many things like that and then you're your parents are so at odds with what you're seeing on TV or in the magazines you read or the books you read, then because obviously we're not represented, we weren't represented in those days. So you just see the funniness, I guess, the funniness of the ethnic people that you're surrounded by. And that's that's how you deal. You just try and laugh because there's literally no other way for you to handle that. Yeah. No, I completely understand. And thanks so much for um, providing that insight. I really um, appreciate it. I did just want to say about that kind of brick throwing scene. I think um, racism isn't just brick throwing, like physical brick throwing. Um, there's so many kinds of other insidious racism. And so I think in Funny Ethnics, that brick um the forcefulness of that brick entering um, Sylvia's family's life, it was kind of like a moment where her family, her parents had to kind of confront the fact, um, is this just a one-off incident? Is this just the opinion of one brick thrower? Or is this the opinion of everyone on this street, in this neighbourhood? And because Pauline Hansen's on the TV screen every night saying these things like, is this the whole country throwing bricks at us, at our communities? And that's the feeling. That's the kind of force that really jerks us around and makes us question whether we're worth, like, respect, as you were saying, when you're, like, in a room and you still feel like, um, you still question whether you can be there, even though you're such an accomplished, amazing writer. Like, I feel that too. And, um, yeah, I I wonder when we'll stop feeling that. <laughs> and it's sad because that, you know, that insidious racism is something that, you know, Sylvia experiences in her first job. Um, in like so many formative parts of her life, like things that she should be excited about. You know, <laughs> other people just get to experience going to work or starting a new job. Um, but she's got to negotiate so many things like backhanded compliments or the, these little microaggressions. And they don't, they don't stop for people like us. Um, no, they don't. And sometimes um, a defence mechanism is just to laugh it off yeah. because... Um, the alternative, speaking up and speaking out against it, there's repercussions to that and there's consequences to that as well. 
And one of the defense mechanisms that she uses is the model minority voice. She ends every sentence with a shy smile and an enthusiastic nod. Um, the academic Anne Brewster describes performative ethnicity as enacted via various strategies and positions where minorities like ourselves must perform in a way that suits various contexts and audiences depending on where we are. So how does Sylvia's performance enable her to get in and out of certain situations? And when you think about your own experiences performing over the years, are you not tired? <laughs> Um, Sarah, yeah, I am tired and, um, I have been tired for many years and I find that in my personal life, I am breaking away from code switching so much. Um, I too went to a selective school and I think in that environment, you are taught the key to how to communicate like a lady, a, a lady, um, and how to express yourself in, in a very articulate and sophisticated manner. So I've learned that. I, I can code switch very quickly. Sometimes when I'm talking on the phone, I'll have, I've heard from many kind of um, friends who are people of colour say to me, when you were speaking to me on the phone, you sounded exactly like a white woman. How did you do that? That's like, how do you even do that? And that's a learned thing. So in Funny Ethnics, Sylvia's parents, um, they've understood that. They, they, they're trying to grapple with Australian life, um, having English as a second language, and they can see how... Um, that's really made their life a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And personally, I remember my dad saying one of the most hurtful things that he remembered hearing Pauline Hansen saying was how uncomfortable she was every time an Asian person or a person of colour tried to speak English and how that accent just really made got under her skin. And he felt so embarrassed by that. And in his own workplace, there was a white manager who said to him, you know what, um, I don't think you should present to clients. I think your accent's a bit thick. Why don't you just stick to making the PowerPoints and then the managers will present to the clients. And so my parents were so scarred by those experiences that, um, yeah, and yes, Sylvia's experiences in the book drawn from my personal ones. So um, Sylvia's parents, encourage her to read, watch the evening news, read sophisticated newspapers, learn how newsreaders structure their sentences, how they speak with authority, how they kind of have a low and calm tone when they're speaking to make sure that the other person believes in what they're saying and then they're speaking from a place of deep knowledge. So I learned that and Sylvia in the book learned that from a very early age. That's how you get by and that's how you, um, uh, that's how you, you almost get basic respect in Australian society. That's what Sylvia is taught um, from a young age. And so, um, yeah, it's a code switching is about, I think, understanding that there are different versions of the English language. And if you use different, uh, versions of the English language, you will receive different levels of respectability in the English language, in English speaking society that you're living in. Um, these days in my personal life, I've really tried to break free of that. I don't try and fit in as many long words and sophisticated words that I see in newspapers. I don't try and cram that into every sentence that I say or um, kind of speak. I just want to speak as plainly as possible, but in the plainness of my language, um, I hope that in the plainness of the language in this book, that the reader can understand profound things. And that's how I approach life. And that's how I approach my writing practice these days. But what about you, Sarah? Like how, how has code switching kind of impacted you and what does it mean for you these days? I think 
um, there's safety in numbers these days. So when I was growing up, there wasn't the opportunity for us to talk about these things. And like you, I'm realizing that I don't have to apologize for who I am anymore. And even in spaces where I'm with family who, you know, my, my husband is white. So even when I'm with his um, extended family, where I, whereas before, and I really feel sorry for Sarah a long time ago, um, even though no one made me feel a certain way, it was just, again, those little insidious things that happened in all parts of my life that made me feel like I just had to belong. Whereas now I'm like, I walk around and like, I'm so proud of who I am and my culture and what I've accomplished um, that it's like, you know, it, and, and I think um, it, even like hearing the story that you shared about your dad really broke my heart because people like his white manager and Pauline Hansen have never made the effort to learn another language. So your father is coming and speaking two languages and they are putting him down because they're just speaking the one language that they were taught from birth. So this kind of stuff really bothers me. And I think the code switching has changed over the years because now I come at these experiences from a place of rage. Um, <laughs> and I'm thankful that I have people like you in my networks that organizations like Sweatshop exist. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Sweatshop later to advocate for culturally and linguistically diverse writers. And I still use that term, but then I'm like, culturally and linguistically diverse to who? Like <laughs> when we use that term, we're centering, you know, like what? Yeah. You know who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just really, really interesting. But, um, I want to come back to something that you said about the plainness of the language. And I want to use a example from the text. So I'm just going to scroll out of my order. Um, so I describe this book as Rai. It's very intelligent, but in a not so obvious way. So the plainness of your language really works in this scene. So you're not clobbering on the people on the head with your message. Um, so there's a, a fairly innocuous scene in which Silver's, Sylvia's mum is buying mandarins. And you describe them as Fanta orange. Now, that's very plain language. But the mandarins have an Australian-shaped sticker on them with the word imperial on it. And so for me, that is so clever and so smart because the language is plain. You're just telling us what you see. But the word imperial on Australia just says so much. And I don't think this kind of humour or even this kind of clever humour is easily done, even by career authors. And I'd love to know about the inspirations for the way that you approached the work itself in terms of the craft of writing it in this way, with that plain language that does a lot. So I also, the reason why I kind of stepped away from my code switching days and really focus on plain language was when I started kind of turning up to sweatshop workshops and being surrounded by young First Nations and writers of colour um, from Western Sydney, I started to notice that there are particulars to how we communicate in Western Sydney. And I think in Western Sydney, we speak very plainly, but we cut straight to the bone. And I think there is such a beauty in that. And that's why Western Sydney is honestly the home of like great Australian writing. Um, and why I wanted to stick to plain writing in funny ethnics as well is because I've seen entertainers in mainstream Australian media mock the way that Western Sydney people speak. And often these characterizations of people from Western Sydney um, kind of paint us as unintelligent and inarticulate. And I want this book to be a statement on how that's absolutely not true. Um, 
in terms of describing things as Fanta orange um, and noticing the sticker on it, I think that I always try and have descriptions be a way to shape the world in a story. And this is what Sylvia knows. She's grown up with soft drinks. She's grown up with fast food. She's grown up with processed foods that, oh, apparently you're not meant to eat these days. But that's her world. That's what she knows. And she understands a lot about what her place in this world is. And so I think writing is about building entire worlds word by word. And so the words that I choose when I write things so plainly, I try and choose them extremely concisely. And so we not only understand what exactly what shade of orange that mandarin is, but how Sylvia's knowledge of that shade of orange is shaped by the context around her. Um, and so, yeah, I just think it's time to embrace the beauty of expressing profound things in really simple ways. Yeah, thank you. We have so much to learn from that. So touching <laughs> food, Sylvia has a toxic relationship with food in a part of the book that's really reflective of early noughties culture. So we were surrounded by images of waif-like models. Is Sylvia's relationship with food about being able to control one element of a life that is otherwise outside of her control in terms of how mainstream Australia sees her, her lack of belonging, being torn between, I guess, two worlds, um, especially because she was growing up at a time when, unlike now, diversity doesn't come with any clout? Um, Sylvia's food... Uh, Sylvia's food. Sylvia's relationship with food, food is very much about control and it's very much also about fitting in. Mm. And so she not only observes that there's a reverence of thinness within American pop culture, which inevitably like um, filters down to Australian pop culture, but she's noticing that thinness is very much prized in another pop culture that at the time is influencing the way that the world views Asian women. And I'm talking about K-pop culture. Mm. Um, and so I think there's a line in Funny Ethnics where Sylvia says, from east to west, in order to be enough, you just have to be smaller. And I probably am misquoting myself, but... <laughs> you know, whatever. The book came out like a year ago. Sometimes I look at it, I don't even know what's in there. But I, I remember that that line went something along those lines. And basically the point is um, Sylvia sees thinness as the key to being perceived as feminine, as beautiful and as enough. And I think it's really sad that thinness seems to be making a comeback and in this day and age I'm seeing thinness being repackaged as um, fitness yeah. and so I think there's a lot of insidious things about the current fitness culture that aren't too different to that early noughties culture that you know we had waif like models on the cover and the, of the on the covers of magazines and magazines just talking very openly about which female celebrity was looking a bit chunky that day i don't think it's too different in this day and age i know that we had words like body positivity floating around but i i actually think we're we're very much back to the early noughties um and i've just been kind of observing fitness culture in terms of like the language around eating this whole intermittent fasting thing if there's a lot of language that manipulates and covers what that actually is I think intermittent fasting you can call that time starvation so um yeah I think Sylvia's toxic relationship with food sadly is not a thing of the past for many young women these days it's something that I'm quite passionate about and um it is a way to control, but it is also something that can really control you. So, um, 
That's yeah. a really interesting <laughs> um, answer. And actually, you made me think about something which I've never thought about before, which is very silly of me. But like for ethnic girls who don't fit into the dominant culture, the, mm. getting skinny is a way for them to fit in. And so like you feel for her and you feel for other young women who will do that to, the, to themselves in order to fit in because that's another, like that's their only option. It, it's quite sad. Um, so there's a chapter, uh, actually there's, before I get to that, so you've come up with a really great word and concept <laughs> in a book that I want you to share with everyone listening in today. Um, and that is the idea of being digmatized. Can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Digmatized. So, and I really hope my parents aren't listening tonight. I didn't give them the link or anything, but they know that I'm doing this talk tonight. So I hope they're not, I hope they haven't found a way to be in this space. But um, digmatized in funny ethnics is when you just really let a man kind of walk all over you. I believe the the kind of Gen Z type of um, term these days is F boy, um, and so <laughs> I feel like I feel like there's always that term just keeps morphing, right? It's like the behavior doesn't change, but the terms change. Yeah. But hey, this is literature, and I think one of the great things about literature is that it's a play on language. And so um, a dick is a dick and um, matization is, you know, the systems in which we become entrenched in a man's arms. And um, to be honest, I, I, have to, I have to admit that I actually didn't come up with digmatized. Um, the first time I heard the word digmatized used was by a writer who you probably know as well, Sarah, Peter Politis. Oh, of course Peter came up with that too. Yeah, yeah. So this wasn't actually a conversation about literature. I think yeah. I was talking to Peter about, about my boy problems several yeah. years ago and Peter came back at me and said, Shirley, get your wits together, stop being dignitized. And it's stuck with me since then. I love it. And I love the context in which it is um, explored in the book and the um, character of Tammy. And I wish I'm looking at the time and it's 7.05 and we've got 25 minutes left and I want time for questions. And I have so many questions for Shirley because the book is so good. But I do want to get to some questions about the craft of writing because it's really important for me to ask Shirley, not just about the, you know, people if you introduce yourself as a writer, people will ask you, oh, what have you written? And if you haven't, um, you know, written a book, they don't take you seriously or um, they don't realise the body of work, the drafts that lead to that book. And so I want to talk to you about the craft of writing because I think it's really important. One of the things I do want to ask is... Um, about this book, to me at least, unless I read it wrong, not having a, like a very apparent three-act structure, which is how I was taught to write. And I think it's props to you because the, I'm still writing 10 years in with a three-act structure. Um, <laughs> and um, I feel like you took an option or a route that wasn't safe and you pulled it off really, really well. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the process of doing that. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. I, I do recommend sticking to a three-act structure because working on um, a 75-act structure is not recommended if you want to live a happy life. Um, I'll just be honest, um, funny ethnics the early kind of iterations of this project, I did think about having it as a short story collection, but over the course of a decade, which I spent kind of thinking about this book, it didn't really make sense because the characters always, the same characters always kept on popping up. Mm -hmm. And I, I just really thought to myself, this is Sylvia Nguyen's story across a decade of life. 
And life itself is just so messy. And life itself does not unfold according to three neat parts. And so I just decided to embrace it. Let's let's jump all over the place. Let's um, kind of talk. Let's kind of have like an episodic novel um, and see where it goes. So I, I just decided to embrace it. And in terms of relationships as well, relationships are messy. People come and go out of each other's lives. And I think that's even more compounded with social media these days. Like it seems like relationships never really die these days. And I wanted to express that messiness, um, especially in Sylvia and Tammy's friendship. So they kind of drift in and out and nothing ever ends. Yeah, and I, I absolutely love that. So um, beyond the work, the um, like the actual craft of each sentence, I'm also really interested in the overall, the, the finished product. Um, and we get a lot of like self-help motivational lingo today with anything that we're doing and it's always what's your why. So I thought I would ask you, what was your why for this particular work? For Funny Ethnics, my why was exploring the Vietnamese-Australian experience through a second-generation lens. Um, while I was studying writing at university, I really thought my place in Australian literature was to talk about the boat journey, the Vietnam War, and the trauma associated with those two events. And it took me such a long time to break out of that. And it's really thanks to um, kind of being around the community that Sweatshop has that I really was able to break free from that. And so my why was to really fully explore that formative experience of growing up second generation Vietnamese Australian, where you're not on the boat um, and you weren't dodging uh, bullets and bombs. Um, and what does that mean? And that's not to say those events don't also follow you um, in your life as well. So that's the why. What about you, Sarah? I, I like your body of work is absolutely, absolutely incredible. What's your why? Um, thank you for asking. I don't want to take up too much time because I, I love, like I, I love listening to you. Um, probably, <laughs> um. I want to make young women from my community and from other culturally and linguistically diverse communities not feel how I felt when I was growing up. That real lack of belonging and loneliness. I was really lonely. And I think that stays with you for a really long time. Um, and I just think about how my dream from when I was like nine or 10 was to be a journalist. That was my dream. For, and I never wavered from that except for a very brief period in year 11 where I thought maybe I'll do psychology, but I always really wanted to be a journalist. And I put myself through a journalism degree. I did my master's in journalism and I went out and I did all these internships and I would turn up in the morning two days a week at glossy women's magazines and work for free. And I was a good worker and a hard worker like most migrants and migrant children, I was a hard worker. And it took a Turkish woman pulling me aside to say, as long as there's a blonde girl interning here, you're not gonna get a job. And so, and the other thing was that I realized that if I have to work in this industry, I'm gonna have to trash my community because no matter how much you try, it's just the way that certain news media frameworks operate. And I left, my, I abandoned my dream for a long time and I worked in something that had nothing, for about nine years, that had some, nothing to do with my industry. I write because I don't want girls to go through what I went through. I want them to take up space and to take it up unapologetically. Hopefully that answers your question. Sarah, absolutely, and you are absolutely embodying that, and I'm always inspired by you. So um, I encourage everyone in the audience, please go and grab one of Sarah's amazing books. Um, the book I have here is called The Cult of Romance, and, like, honestly, if you're going to read Funny Ethnics, 
please read The Cult of Romance. Like, I, I believe our books, if, if you read them, um, you can see that we're almost in conversation with each other through our writing. And I love that um, our book covers were both designed by the same guy, which is amazing. Um, okay, I want to ask you, I'm aware we've got about seven minutes before I'm going to go to audience questions, so maybe a bit less. So if anybody has a question, please pop it into the box um, because I would love to ask Shirley. But I do want to ask about Sweatshop. So you won one of the first Sweatshop and a firm press mentorships along with the poet and author Sarah Saleh. What did that mean for your career and what did that mentorship look like for you? It's meant everything for my career, Sarah, and I'm so grateful to Sweatshop and Affirm Press for giving me that opportunity. Um, it's that mentorship really helped me kind of build on the body of work that I had been working on. So um, earlier I said that, you know, Funny Ethnics was, I, I thought it was going to be like a collection of short stories, but it it's really thanks to the amazing editors at Affirm Press that helped me pull it together into a cohesive arc. And I thank um, Ruby Ashby Orr so much for her patience in kind of dealing with all these little bits and pieces and all these fragments, um, but it all came together in the end. And I do want to credit um, Excel, Microsoft Excel, for coming up with a product called Spreadsheets. Um, I remember at one point in the process, um, the, the team at Affirm Press put out all of the chapters in Funny Ethnics in a spreadsheet, had a summary for each chapter and notes on each chapter set telling me, you know, what they thought needed to happen in each chapter or where the gaps were in between the chapters. And um, what do you know, thanks to that spreadsheet, I really took the advice and here we are with funny ethnics nowadays. So spreadsheets, they really help in the writing process. I love it. And I'm really interested in looking at your career beyond this one book. So what have you done that you're really passionate about and proud of? So I remember a long time ago, I read one of your pieces on Asian cooking and MSG and how MSG, like there was like a fear mongering, you know, campaign yeah. against MSG that was actually really representing something far more insidious. So what's something that you're proud of um, and passionate about in your writing? I'd like to see more writing like that from people like us, Sarah. And a few years ago, I participated as a mentor in a program called Storycasters, which is an amazing initiative run by Diversity Arts in Australia, and Sweatshop is a partner in that initiative. And I was able to mentor writers in the craft of review writing. And I learned so much in that experience. Um, there's another one of my essays, which is in Overland, and it's about how white the um, arts reviewing space is. And I want to say that, yes, things are changing marginally, but I was able to write that essay and able to put forward that knowledge because of that opportunity to mentor writers. I could see firsthand how the lack of opportunities was affecting my peers, and I could see firsthand how amazing the arts review space can be when we give diverse voices a chance to um, say what we think on our own terms. And so I look forward to continuing my work with Sweatshop and um, I encourage everyone here to go and follow Sweatshop on social media and um, stay updated on the great work that we do. Amazing. And do you have a writing routine? Um, look, I wish I did and I have to say I don't. But yes, I mean, for funny ethnics, I definitely had a writing routine and that was absolutely any spare bit of time that I had was going to go towards writing. And that didn't actually always look like writing. Um, it was also called, uh, there, was a lot, there was a lot of like thinking time as well. Yes, um, I think that's very instrumental. Sorry to interrupt. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah, so thinking time, reading time. Um, like reading great works like your book here really gets the gears going, Sarah. 
And so if you want to be a writer, you better be reading. And that um, leads us to one of our first questions. Please, guys, if you have a question, pop it into the chat box. A question that we do have comes from um, Abby Dawson, who says, fabulous talk. I would like to know what you are both reading right now. Shirley, what are you reading? So I am reading Songs for the Dead and the Living, written by the amazing Sara Sole at uh, one of my peers at Sweatshop. Um, please do and grab, pl please do go and grab um, a copy of this book. Um, extremely important um, to go and read um, the works of Palestinian writers at the moment. Um, I think, you know, make space for that. I can vouch for that book. It is brilliant. Um, I, I'm actually between books. I just finished reading a book called Thanks for Having Me by Emma Dara. I don't know if I pronounced that right. It's going to be the, um, it's the first release from the Nakia Louis um, or Lou, I don't know how to say her name, um, imprint um, Joan, um, which is really exciting. And I enjoyed that book and I'll be reviewing it soon. And I plan to pick up Hovo, which is the latest anthology um that, sweatshop. Yeah, that um, sweatshop has put out, edited by Adam um, Navodi. And I am excited because a couple of my favourite writers um, from sweatshop have, other than you, <laughs> have <laughs> pieces in there. Um, and that's uh, Natalia Figueroa Barroso and Danny Noor. Um, Danny Noor is... Um, He's the latest, one of the latest recipients of that Sweatshop of Firm Press mentorship. And Natalia is working on her um, debut novel. So please keep an eye out for that, for that book. And some more questions, which is great. Um, are you planning on writing another book, a continuation of Sylvia's journey or another story? Thanks for that question. I do plan on writing another book. At the moment, I'm still figuring out what that will be. But, um, yeah, I guess stay tuned. Um, the, this past year has been a lot of conversations about funny ethnics. And so um, I feel like I'm still kind of in that world. And in order to write another book, I almost have to detach from it a little bit. So I think a process of detachment needs to happen first before I can kind of get into the rhythm of another book. Yeah, awesome. Um, and the next question is from Monica, who says, Sarah, how long did it take, did you take to write your book, Shirley and you too? So Shirley, do you want to answer first? How long did it take you to write Funny Ethnics? So 10 years of thinking and one year of kind of slogging it out in front of a laptop and pulling everything together. What about you, Sarah? Um, so this is not a great answer, but I'm going to give the honest answer. Um, I wrote um, The Cult of Romance as part of my PhD, and my PhD, the first year was like a write-off, and then we had COVID, and it was just a disastrous time, and I was really running out of time. So I wrote it in probably about three or four months, and you can see that in the work because there are things that... I regret not giving more time to. And one of the things that I have learnt over the course of my career, and I hope this is okay to share and people don't take it the wrong way, is like it's not that I rushed my work or I didn't think about it or I didn't think about my reader. Like I have given an advance back because I was contracted for more young adult books, but I felt like I couldn't do it anymore in a way that was fair to my reader and I didn't just want to take the money and do a dodgy job. But one thing that I've really learned from reading really great literature, because I didn't do a creative writing degree or a writing degree in general, I came from media, is reading the work of great writers like Shirley, um, like Amani, like Sarah, like Sarah Saleh, um, lots of people in my community and beyond um, has taught me the value of really taking that thinking time before I write. And so Shirley spoke about thinking time. And this is something I'm trying to do with my work now. So I have a folder next to my bed and I just write things in it and it's just there so that I'm taking my time. Um, and we have a question that says, 
what your ultimate favorite book is, the first title that pops into your mind, Shirley? Um, my favorite book changes all the time. And right, I I have to say The Other Half of You by Dr. Michael Muhammad Ahmed. I absolutely go to that book when I kind of want inspiration, but also just a reminder of how you can play with language and um, how writing can be uh, fun. I love, I loved, loved, loved that book. Um, I'm going to share a couple of picture books um, because we don't always think of picture books and I've really pivoted to picture books, but we don't always think of them as great pieces of literature, but two that I love reading with or without my kids are all the Ways to Be Smart by Davina Bell, because I think it reminds children that you don't just have to get like an A or a, a 90% on a test to be smart, that there are so many other ways that we could be smart. And I was book smart at school, but I can definitely see the value of being other types of smart in the real world today. <laughs> Um, and I also really love 11 Words for Love by Randa Abdel Fattah because it takes my mother tongue, Arabic, a language which has often been demonized and weaponized against my community and shows how really beautiful it is. And there's 11 Words for Love that she explores in that story through a Palestinian family's life, um, which is so nice. Um, well, while I, I'm just going to check because we've got questions coming in from two different chat boxes. So here we are. We've got a question from Ashika. And I apologize if I'm saying people's names wrong. I feel really guilty and I hate being that person. Um, are there any aspects of conventional or white storytelling craft that you have deliberately played with, questioned or abandoned, Shirley? What a great Hi, question. Ishika. Thanks so much for a beautiful question. Um, I'd like to answer this in terms of how I approached um, kind of adding Vietnamese into the text. I think conventionally um, it, languages that aren't in English are kind of italicized and then translated in full in English. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of subvert that. So um, a lot of the Vietnamese in funny ethnics is not italicized. Um, and the way that I've kind of made those translations is more um, subtle and more playful. So I, I don't want to completely shut out non-Vietnamese readers, but I think there are, I think translation itself is a craft and I'd encourage any young writers in the audience who are thinking about incorporating another language to approach that um, with innovation and playfulness as well. I love that answer. Um, and this is something that I've tried to do with the cult of romance for the first time because I did used to um, translate and um, I've learned a lot in my time as a writer and just from my PhD and just becoming a bit more radical. Um, and in the Arabic language, there are letters that we don't have in English. And so we use them when we're texting, like if I'm texting someone um, who speaks Arabic or texting family in Lebanon um, to, I guess, mitigate that gap in the language because I can't, I don't have the Arabic letters on my phone. We use English numbers to represent Arabic letters. It's called something. When Sara Saleh was giving a talk, she um, spoke about it. And now I forget what it's called, but that's what I've done in the cult of romance, which um, I'm really happy that I felt brave enough to do that because I think it was a big leap for me. Um, you've got a question from Andrew Clark who says, have you ever sat next to someone on a plane or train and realised they were reading your book? Andrew, I haven't. <laughs> um, I haven't. And the day that that happens, I'll be... Um, I'll be very surprised because it, this all still feels very unreal to me. <laughs> I must say, you, Sarah? yeah, look, um, I was going to say, I must say that everyone should go to the library and get a copy of um, the bookmarks 
that mm. that have put with the funny ethnics on the cover. I got to, I was so excited when I saw them because I was like, what if Shirley doesn't have one? Um, no, and, she okay, okay, well, <laughs> for you. Um, I was like, this is the most exciting thing. So having a bookmark in libraries across Australia with your book on it is a pretty awesome thing. So it's not the same thing, Shirley, but it's a pretty <laughs> Thing. And I'm going to answer your question, Andrew. So this happened to me once where I was on a train on the Bankstown line going to the city and in someone's bag I could see my first novel and when someone turned around it was my cousin. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's still, it was exciting, but, you know, cousins, we look out for each other. You know, that's one thing that we can count on. Um and Abby Dawson asks, what emerging Western Sydney authors should we keep a lookout for? So Abby, um, follow definitely follow Sweatshop on um, our Instagram and Facebook. I've got Pablo right here. So let me just grab that. So Povo is our latest anthology, Abby, and um, all of the writers in here definitely um, are writers that you should look out for. Um, we've already mentioned the couple. So Danny Noor, he's working on his um, debut uh, novel at the moment with Affirm Press. Um, but, yeah, please do follow Sweatshop. Um, we always kind of promote the great work that our writers are doing. And next month we have um, Sweatshop Managing Director Winnie Dunn's debut comes out. I think it's in March. And that's yes, called yes. The, the Poor Islanders. So you should yeah. definitely keep an eye out for that. And, um you know, it, it, I'm sure it will be an amazing read. So in addition to all the names we mentioned, um, yeah, add that one to your list. Um, any other questions before we wrap up for the evening? Well, it was an absolute pleasure to, to chat about Funny Ethnics. I had so many more questions. I had um, tabs in the book that I wanted to read from. Um, I never got that far because the conversation was just too scintillating. Um, and Shirley was a very gracious person and asked about my work, which she did not have to do. And I think that's really important to acknowledge because she deserves yeah. to be the topic of the entire conversation. Um, but she was so gracious. And I think part of being an Australian author is not worrying about how another book is doing or how another author is doing, but lifting everyone up. Because when you step into a bookstore and you're buying, you're going to look for one book, you're going to see all those other ones there. And we just really should encourage each other. We do have one final question, actually. Yes, that I just saw that. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'm going to um, ask you to answer that, Shirley. When you read your own book, does it transport you to the characters as well? As well? What a great question. Um, I have to say I, I do not really read my own book much only because, um, you know, I've, I've read that book to death and back while working on it. But um, does it transport me to the character's world? Well, I'm living in it. I'm living in this world. Coming to you from Parramatta, which is near Yaguna. <laughs> Amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, Shirley for joining me in conversation um, please pick up a copy of Funny Ethnics you won't regret it it's really brilliant um, and I look forward to seeing more of what you write Shirley. Sarah to you as well you've always been so inspiring and you're an absolute powerhouse in um, Australian writing so I can't wait to see what you do next as well. Thank you have a good night everyone. <laughs>